everybody. Uh, I'm Rick. So I'm good to see everybody again. I know it's a lot of familiar faces. The most important thing you can get out of this presentation today is uh, my website. So this is my website here. Uh, and I have an IPv6 resource page that I'll show you towards the end here. Uh, but I'll show you here in a moment. If you're interested in any of my CCNA or CCNP PowerPoint materials, they're on my website. I do have a username and password for those, and I give it out freely, and you can give it out freely. It's just like 20 years ago, Cisco asked me to password protect it. So, but Cisco and Perlman. Are you going to use the Cisco case sentence? Uh, it's lower lowercase. And that's after Roddy of Perlman. I haven't uh, updated my route course yet, but I will be doing that here quickly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so just to really quick, the website here, just in case you, you fall asleep or leave. Uh, this is my IPv6 resource page here, and uh, so it takes you. You can go to presentations. And I just com just did a video series, not a big deal, for Cisco Press uh, uh, Live Lessons. And the deal I made with them was that the PowerPoints that I create used for the video series are mine. And I can put them on my website for people. They don't belong to Cisco Press. So all I have to do is take the Cisco Press logo off them, and I can so all this material, matter of fact, the PowerPoints you can see today, they're just excerpts out of some of these. So feel free to use these. They're all animated. And um, yeah, the live lesson service. So somebody watching these videos on the live lessons, if they have that also? Yeah, it's, a, it's the same PowerPoints. Okay. Yeah. Or you can just have me come to your house. <laughs> and I can talk over the PowerPoints. As long as we cook. As long as you cook. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. OK. All right, so let's get started here. So you know me and my slides. Uh, so I'm going to, you know, try and get through these. Bless you. Thank you. Uh, IPv6 in uh, 60 slides in 60 minutes. So some of these I'm going to go over relatively quickly. Uh, yeah, not bad for me. Yeah, that's <laughs> definitely true. OK, so just some resources. Uh, well, first of the agenda, I'm going to cover just in a couple of slides why IPv6. You know, when are we going to it? Uh, what about IPv5 and NAT? Just a couple of slides. We're going to spend some time on the IPv6 address representation. It's, it's a lot easier to write and understand IPv6 addresses than IPv4. It really is. I know you don't believe me. Uh, IP, so I'm going to take a look at IPv6 global unicast addresses. These are public IPv6 addresses that we don't really. I could talk about private IPv6 addresses a little later, but get away from the whole IPv4 NAT network. Link local unicast addresses, a very important IPv6 address in the IPv6 world. We'll get to that. And spend some time on two subjects that are really different in IPv6, and that's dynamic address allocation. And the way that's done is using SLAC, stateless address auto configuration. And then there's a couple of options with that. SLAC with uh, stateless DHCPv6, and there's also stateful DHCPv6. So, so there's really three main ways of dividing that automatically get its global unicast address. And then just <coughs> for a end note, I'll talk about DHCPv6 prefix <coughs> delegation. That's how your home network can get its own IPv6 network address. So um, how many of you have Comcast as your ISP? You can get native IPv6. They've already turned it on. They say pretty much nationally, uh, they've quietly turned it on to the home. And I can tell you what, what it takes to get an IPv6 prefix if you run IPv6 at home. And the cool thing is, after you get IPv6 
installed at home or if we're running it at school in our, in our department is you get on the browser and nothing changes. <laughs> you know, you think it would be like new colors or sounds or something, but it's like, wow, it's exactly the same. Okay. All right. So for more information, yeah, there's a book out. I uh, just finished the video series, but that, I, you know, I'm not trying to sell anything. But these are the PowerPoints on my website that go with the video series. So you don't need to actually listen to me. You can just download my PowerPoint. They're all animated, feel free to use them any way you wish. And eventually, my goal is IPv6 the amusement park. <laughs> <laughs> We're not there yet. I'm trying to follow in the, you know, the, uh, the, follow the movie industry here. Okay, so why IPv6? Okay, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of reasons. One main reason is we, we're running out of addresses. We're running out of IPv4 addresses. So back, it's been almost, what, four years now that IAN actually ran out of IPv4 addresses. They gave out the last of their address blocks to the regional internet registries. And these five regional internet registries are beginning to run out of IPv4 addresses. Uh, some are just about out. They're holding on to the last few that they have left. And again, talking to some ISPs, they've run out already as well. So, you know, it, it really have no choice. Uh, and if you look at the world, this is uh, from 2014, this released last summer. They update this about every two years. But you look at the population, look at North America. You know, here about 350 million people in North America. Compare that to Africa and Asia, that's about 5 billion right, population. Well, you look at the internet penetration rate. We're at about 90% in North America. 90% internet penetration rate. I mean, we have enough IPv4 addresses. We're doing pretty well fine for, for nine, about 9 out of 10. But you compare that and a much smaller population, you compare that to Asia and Africa, 26, 34%, but that's a 5 billion people. So those are areas of the world that are actually way ahead in implementing IPv6 because they've had no choice. Okay, and there's other benefits as well. I can talk more about that if, you know, but really the killer application for the internet itself, besides the IOE stuff and end-to-end -end reachability and peer-to-peer -peer networking, it's the internet itself. To continue with the internet, we need to eventually move to IPv6. Okay, so what happened to IPv5? Okay, well IPv5, there was already a protocol uh, called uh, this is years ago, back in the 70s, called Internet Stream Protocol. And it was a protocol to deliver or provide quality of service to real-time and multimedia applications. It wasn't a new IP protocol, but this is what happened. When it was encapsulated over IP, over IP it used IP version 5 in the header instead of the 4. So it was basically taken up. So that's why they, it's IPv6. All right. Um, and one of the things that we've got a kind of different mindset in a transition to IPv6 is no more of this network address translation to hide our networks, hide our, our networks from the outside world. So that has been a, a great way to provide, really to, to, to keep IPv4 alive for a long time. Keep those 4.3 billion addresses from running out. That would have run out in the early 1990s if it wasn't for NAT and private addresses. But that works out. This works great if you are initiating the communications from inside your network. Where it doesn't work very well is if you, if somebody from the outside is trying to reach you. You know, unless you do some kind of port forwarding or something else. 
So IPv6 is all about end-to-end -end reachability. So we can, any device can reach any other device on the internet. <laughs> I won't spend a lot, I won't, I can talk to you later about security. But NAT was never intended by IETF as a security measure. We have used it to hide ourselves and make ourselves unreachable to a certain extent from the outside world. But it was never meant as a security feature. So what about security? I can talk to you later about this, but it's, it's most of the vulnerabilities and where they're happening today are not with end-to-end -end reachability, but with you know, us going to websites, us downloading software, us opening email attachments, etc. And they, they still say that you need to, sh you should still have some sort of stateful firewall between you and the outside world. Yeah. Rick, you know, before I've always looked at it, we're going to migrate from IPv4 to IPv6. Mm -hmm. And now in the last year, I've sort of looked at it as like we're actually going to have two numbering schemes existing side by side, an IPv4 numbering scheme and an IPv6 <coughs> scheme. I just want to run through that by you if I become personal or if that's... No, that's exactly what's going to happen. So let's talk about transitions. <coughs> so there's different ways to transition to IPv6. Now, I'm not going to spend any time on these. And really, as far as an instructor, I don't spend any time on these. One is like tunneling to put IPv6 packets in IPv4. These are temporary transition methods. So there's tunneling. You put an IPv6 packet over here inside an IPv4 packet, send it over the IPv4 networks, and then unencapsulate it by the other IPv6 device and you can talk IPv6 back in. All right, that's tunneling. NAT64 is a way to translate a an IPv6 address to IPv4, send it over an IPv4 network, and translate it back to an IPv6 address. But again, these are temporary transition methods. And really where we're <coughs> headed is towards native IPv6. ISPs are turning this on at the edges. Uh, we run, if, if in California, uh, come from California schools, and you can get an IPv6 address from Scenic. Um, and it's a great way to start getting familiar with IPv6. Build a test network. Uh, get, get a public address from Scenic and start implementing it. But native IPv6 is really the way to go. And that's just IPv6 to IPv6, and this is where the ISPs are already ha headed. So I think these tunneling and other transition technologies, they're going to be needed, mostly I think by the ISPs, <coughs> and just to be able to transition to edges where they can't go native right, right away. But to answer your question, uh, we are going to be running IPv4 and IPv6 together for the foreseeable future. And that's known as dual step, and that's not going to go away. So I, I don't know, but if you get, if you get, let's say, like a Linux router, uh, home, home product, consumer product, off the shelf, is that by default? Is that still IPv4? Or it's well, that's a good question. You have to get if so. If you want to go IPv6 at home, if you could, well, Comcast will provide you with the IPv6 and IPv4 router modem if you want to go there, and if it's all in one. Uh, I like to have my own router, not the Comcast thing. So what you have to make sure is for Comcast, you have to have an IPv6 enabled router. They're not all enabled. So I have a Linksys EA6500, I think it is. It's IPv4 and IPv6. And your modem, if it's not, you know, the one embedded with Comcast, has to also be IPv6 enabled. And I believe Comcast requires that for its IPv6 manageability. But that's all it takes. Just don't call customer customer support to talk about IPv6. <laughs> 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 okay. I try. I and I'll tell you what, what, what I called them about in a moment. But it, it's it's already there. And 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 the and 
the exciting part of it is you get on your computer, you IP config, and you see an IPv6 address. You go to Facebook, do Wireshark, it's running IPv6, and look around and nobody cares. Uh, right. <coughs> Facebook doesn't look any different. But it's cool. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and start getting into the meat of this stuff. So I'm going to go through some of this a little, little fast so we can get to the heart of a lot of this stuff. This is the difference between the IPv4 header and the IPv6 header. The IPv6 header is a much simpler header. It's also a fixed uh, header length, which has some big advantages in processing. So I'm not going to spend any time on that. But what I want to get is into addressing. Source and destination IPv6 addresses. And to understand that, we need to understand hexadecimal number systems. How many people here are familiar with hex? Okay. So I love hex. Hex is great. I would, you know, wish IPv4 would have used it in its addressing because instead of using the dotted decimal notation, it would have made subnetting so easy. And we're going to see that. I'm going to teach you subnetting IPv6 in two minutes, which is really the main reason why you should go to IPv6. But any hexadecimal digit, or any four bits, I should say, can be represented by a single hexadecimal digit. This makes addressing so much easier once you get used to looking at the addresses. And you will. OK, so here's the IPv6 address notation in hex. So one hex digit, one hex digit is four bits. So each one of these is four bits. <laughs> okay. The address is actually eight 16 bit segments. <laughs> so each one of these segments, informally known as a hextet, you know, we have octets in IPv4. So we can call these hextets, is 16 bits, 4444. Four, four, four. Each 16 bit hextet is separated by a colon. Okay. Gosh, that looks ugly. All right, but it's really not that bad. I'm going to show you a little trick coming up. Okay, it's actually easier to read and it's easier to submit. All right, so how many addresses is this? Okay, well, in IPv4 we have about 4.3 billion addresses. In IPv6 we have 128 bit addresses. We have 340 undecillion. That's a lot. Undis is that like undecided? Undecided, yeah. Well, I don't know. Could be. <laughs> but um, this is uh, undecillion is one followed by 36 zeros. We're not going to run out. I and mean, yeah, if, you know, I have students all the time telling me, well, that's is not what they said by IPv4. So I will give people refunds to my book and video if we run out. Because I'll be dead, so I'll be here. <laughs> okay. So how to write these? So first of all, reduce the size. So we don't have to write out all, all those hex or all those digits in every hex text. There's two simple rules. First rule is any leading zeros can be omitted. My car phone is coming out a little weird on these on this computer, but you get the you can see where the leading zeros can be omitted. Only the leading zeros, and I'll show you why in a moment. But leading zeros in any of these addresses, in any hex text, can be omitted. Only leading zeros. So no trailing zeros. So that's one way to reduce the size of writing out the address. So wherever we see a colon and not four hex digits, only two, Precede them with zeros. Okay, and why only leading zeros? Well, if we could do trailing zeros too, we wouldn't know where the zeros are on this. We wouldn't know well, any of these addresses would work. Well, only leading zeros. So this is the only that this would be the value. Does that make sense? Leading zeros only. Okay. The next rule reduces writing these things out even further. 
which is in most cases how we're going to be writing this. And that's using the double colon. The double colon can be used to represent any single contiguous string of all zero hex tags. What? This is an all zero hex tag. Here's a string of them. So we can use the second rule to reduce that whole string of all zero hex tags to a single double colon. Now we can use the first rule to, reduce, to omit the leading zero here and the leading zeros here. Can we do anything with this? No. Can't do anything with that. So the way our address comes out is it can omit the zero there, omit the leading zeros here, and just use a double colon. And that's what it looks like. Now you're still probably thinking, but Rick, that's still, gosh, how do I read that thing? I'll just see the numbers. And it shows <coughs> real simple rules that I use that makes it really easy. Okay. But first, before we get there, the double colon. You can only use it once. So if I have this address here, I have a couple of options. I can use the double colon here to represent this string. Now over here, I can just omit the leading zero. Does that make sense? I think that's fine. The other option I have is to use the double colon here to represent this group of two all zero hex texts, and then use the first rule here to omit the leading zero. Is that okay? Now, which one should you use? Both of these are, kind of, are really okay. But of course, they like to have a rule for everything. So there's actually an RFC that states this. Whenever you have more than one all zero hex string of hex text, use the double colon in the longest group. Which makes sense. Use the double colon to represent the longest. But in this case, they're both two hex sets. So the rule actually states, well, when they're equal, use the double colon on the first group. But I've seen it written both ways, but this is just to kind of standardize things a little bit more. Will the machine understand both? Be the same? Well, that's a good question. So usually, yes. Uh, like Cisco IOS understands either way. For now. Okay. So, Rick, um, yeah. that, that, uh, at the bottom of that, that's incorrect. Well, it's, I, I wouldn't say it's incorrect. It should be nothing in the beginning. According to RFC, it should be nothing well, for those first two and then zeros down here. So, uh, both of these are acceptable by most operating systems. This is just saying, the RFC is just saying, really, we, we should start standardizing on which way to use it. So this is more, I don't want to say a recommendation, but they're kind of pushing that way. Guys, Okay, and you can only use the double colon once. Because if you use the double colon twice, we could be that. Could be that, could be that. So only use the double colon once. Okay. How are we feeling so far? All right. Okay, so let's get into global unicast addressing. And we to talk, so the IPv6 address types, we have different types of address. We're going to look at global unicast and link local unicast. If we have time, or I'm glad to talk later, about this over here, unique local. That's similar to private RFC 1918 addresses, but it's used differently in IPv6. I can talk about that later or talk to you offline about it, copy and talk to you about it. Okay, so let's take a look at global unicast addresses. This is the addresses that our devices can use to communicate. Okay, so source and destination addresses for both IPv4 and IPv6 are always a phone. 
are always a unicast. No, the source is always a unicast for both IPv4 and IPv6. The unicast it can only come from one device. The destination address can be a unicast or a multicast or it's also known as an anycast. I won't get into that here. Let's look at global unicast addresses. These are any address that starts with a 2 or a 3 is a global unicast address. And I'll explain why in a moment. These are globally unique. These are equivalent to public IPv4 addresses in the IPv6 world. Now, you're going to see in a lot of documentation, all my PowerPoints, a lot of books, that they're always going to use this address, 2001DV8. Okay? And you'll see it in the Cisco curriculum now. This is a reserved address for documentation and educational purposes. So that's why you see that a lot. It's like the 555 area code. It's like the 555 area code. Or in IPv4, we'd use private addresses to, you know, to refer for our examples. Okay. So a global unicast address. You see it where it talks about this range here, 2000, double colon 3. This is the prefix length, the subnet mask. And what that means is that the first three bits is 001. So without going into the details here, so you know, I can talk more about it later. I just want to cover quite a few things. When you have the first three bits, 001, and you don't care what the rest of the those four hex sets are, this is the range of addresses that you get. Anything beginning with a two, and then with a beginning with a two or three. So what how we got that is this is actually represents the 001, one eighth of the IPv6 address space. Of those 340 unused addresses, IANA said, look, we don't need to start allocating from this entire pie. Let's just take one eighth of the pie and start allocating from that. Okay, so except under very specific circumstances, this is the addresses your home devices will be using. Your devices at school, at work, will have a global unicast address to communicate with other devices. Um, just a little terminology here. In IPv6, when we use the term prefix, we mean network address or the network portion of an address. That's your and then we also do that in IPv4, by the way. So that's a prefix. The prefix length is the subnet math. And we do that using slash notation. I'm going to explain more of that in a moment, but here it's a slash 64, and I'll talk more about that later. The interface ID. When we say interface ID, that's the same as the host portion in an IPv4 address. We use the term interface ID because <coughs> the things that are going to be getting IPv6 addresses and connecting to the internet aren't just host computers anymore. It can be anything. And yes, a device can have multiple IPv6 addresses, global unicast addresses. Okay, this is why we love IPv6. IPv4, 32 bits, we have a network portion of our address, and we have a host portion. And our subnet mass tells us, divides the host portion from, or the network portion from the host portion. And then we want to teach subnet, right? Uh, and I know about you, but I spend way too much time on subnetting IPv4. We borrow bits from the host portion to create the subnet portion. And then when you write it out in dotted decimal, it looks really weird. Okay? So it doesn't fall on a, a natural dotted boundary. Okay. This is why you love IPv6. You just don't know it. 128 bits, lots of addresses. 
first of all, an interface ID of 64 bits. Okay. And so, except under certain circumstances, that in majority, majority, majority of cases, a device is a network or subnet is going to have an interface ID of 64 bits slash 64, even point-to-point -point links. And I can talk more about that a little later. Okay, but here's the cool part. We have a global routing prefix. This is the part that is given to us by our ISP. This is what Scenic gives Cabrillo as slash 48. The beauty of this is that reads, in our case, and in most cases, a 16-bit its subnet IG. It's done for us. We don't have to borrow from the host, from the interface ID. Can you? Yes. Okay. Do you need to? No. Okay. So what this gives us, first of all, 64-bit interface ID. This gives each one of your subnets 18 quintillion devices per subnet. And so at Cabrillo, we have a 16-bit subnet ID, which gives us 65,536 subnets. Each, each subnet has 18 quintillion devices. And guess what? There's no broadcast address, so you get, and you can use the all zeros address. So you get to use every bit of those 18 quintillion. Question? How, how does the device <coughs> choose if it's, uh, if it's uh, the number? Does it go by the lowest number and then move up? That's you mean how, how it gets this yeah, part? Oh, I'm going to talk about that. Okay, well, how it gets I'll, this? I'll wait, yeah. yeah, I'll talk about that. Okay, so reading this, I have a little rule that I made up. I call it my 314 rule or 44. And this will help in any, most of the networks we're going to be dealing with will be slash 48. So let me explain that. The global routing prefix from the provider is a slash 48 in many cases. So that means the first three hex tests is how the internet sees us. The next hex tet is the subnet ID. So the next hex tet is our subnet. Now, 3 plus 1 is 4, so the first four hex tets, that's the network portion of our address. The rest, which is four hex tets, that's the interface ID. So in most cases, it's that easy to know what, how the internet sees you, but how what your network is, what the subnet is, and what the host portion is. In IPv4, you start using, you know, slash, slash 19, slash 27 addresses, and it's students are like, oh, gosh, what first host, last host of each subnet range, what is it? This is so easy. I'm going to show you here. So one, two, three, that's how the provider sees it. But this is our subnet. So the first four hextets, one, two, three, four, is our network address. This fourth one, three, one, this is our subnet. And the last four is the interface ID. So when we look at this, it says one, two, three, four. Oh, okay, there's the network. One, two, three, that one. Oh, there's our subnet. Oh, the rest of that, there's the interface ID. It's that easy. Okay, so let's do subnetting in two minutes or less. You take the hex, the subnet ID, hex tet, and you increment in hex. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, A, B, C, D. Do that. 65,536 times, I get to all Fs. There we go. We're done. It's that easy. Now, you can make life harder for you. I can talk about that later, but don't. Okay? It's really that easy. I mean, if there's no other reason why we should dump IPv4 into this. 
and or also my students like IPv6. You showed this after IPv4. Something. Yes. I did just wait. Just wait. Okay. So this would be an abbreviation of one of the subnets, one, two, three, four, the fourth one being the subnet ID. Let me just show you here I've got, if you're familiar with Cisco CCNA material, here is just a simple router with three interfaces. It's this easy to, con to, to determine different subnets. Here I have one, two, three, four. Here's the hex. Here's the subnet ID. Double colon one. So that's the IPv6 address on this router. And then this is the prefix link. And notice that there's no space here. Okay. Well, how do I, how would I configure these two addresses for these other two interfaces? Same thing. IPv6 address. Here's the address. Here's all we change is here's our subnet. It's that easy. Let me do one for the serial interface. But this is why we love IPv6. And all we got to do is a 314 rule. Three. Notice they all have the first three. This is our provider, how our, how the, our provider sees us. And then we subnet it, changing the subnet ID. That's it. If you don't subnet, what would be the fourth hexnet? If you don't subnet, well, your subnet is going to fall someplace. If I'm not sure what you mean if you don't subnet. Well, no subnetting. No subnetting? Oh, it can be, well, if you don't subnet, yeah. uh, it would be all zeros. So, that, so for example, at home, I, uh, Comcast gave me a single subnet. Now, it happens to be a slash 64, but it's, uh, if I didn't subnet, so if my ISP sees me as 2001DV8 cafe, so that's how they see me, slash 60, or I'm sorry, slash 48. Okay. That's how they see me. All right, so all zeros. So, yeah, just be all zero. So when I create my addresses, if I had just one subnet, I would say 2001DB8, cafe. Now, I could just use the double colon. I'm going to use that here, double colon. And let's say I put a one here for an interface, slash 64. Now, we have this is 48. But we have 16 bits in here. I'll do it in hex. That is part of the subnet ID. Does that make sense? So if you don't subnet, then you're just using you just use the all zeros. All right, link local unicast. So in IPv6. Link local is very important, the link local address. The link local address could be a source address, could also be a destination address. So let me talk a little bit why link local addresses are so important in IPv6. Link local, local to the link. Link means network or the subnet, okay? That's what a link is, local to that subnet to the network that we are on. Um, a link local address allows any IPv6 device to communicate with any other IPv6 device on its own link, on its own network. Okay. So we talk about why that's important. These addresses are not routable off the link. So let me mention, let me get there, don't we have to be unique on the link? Okay, to be an IPv6 device, your computer does not need a global unicast address. It only needs one IPv6 address and it must have. And guess what that is? A what? Link local address. 
If you've done IP config on your computer at home, and you see that FE80 blah, 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 blah for IPv6, that's a link local address. So this is almost a, a you know, replacement, but instead of a, like a MAC address? No, it's, you still have a MAC address. No, I understand you still have a MAC address. I'll talk about why this is important. Okay. okay. So the first thing, it must have at least a link local address. If it gets a global unicast address, that's great. But these are great. Um, let me get through this real quick. Here's the range. FE, so they begin with these first 10 bits. So you usually see it as FE80, but it can be anything from FE80 to FEBF. So you see FE something, it's a link local, usually. Anything in that range, FE80. Let me talk a little bit about the beauty of this link local address. Your computer, and I'm going to show you how it does this in a moment. Any device can give itself <coughs> its own link local address without, as soon as it boots up, without talking to anything else. I now have an IPv6 address I just gave myself, a link local address. How did you do that, Rick? I'll show you. But here's the beauty of that. What that means is it can now talk IP. It can talk to any other device on its own network. Including the router, the default gateway, or some other device that it gets a global unicast at. All of a sudden, it can communicate on the network solely by waking up. No DHCP server needed. No static addresses needed. Okay, you can see why that's important. Okay. So let's say that this, the link local address is FE80, and then there's this interface ID. How does this device give itself the interface ID? Okay. Well, the interface ID can come different ways. It can use a process called EUI64, and I'm going to show you that. The Cisco routers use this, and some operating systems. My Mac OS uses it. Windows, Vista, and earlier use this. The other way that it can give itself as a interface ID is a random 64-bit value. Just say, let me come up with my own 64 bits. Okay, or you can statically configure it. Now, the only reason, the only put time we do this is on routers. I'm going to show you why in a moment. Okay, EUI 64. Well, I got like five minutes left and I have barely touched. I know that I've got some lab stuff which I can give you to do home too, packet tracer stuff. Do you want to continue with the presentation a little bit more so I can give you all the good stuff? Yeah. All right. So let's talk about the EUI 64. Now, link local address. I'm waking up. How do I give myself that interface ID? I take my MAC address which is 48 bits. Now I've got to make it 64 bits. All right, let me just split it apart. Let me insert 16 bits, FFFE. There's my 64-bit interface ID. All right, but one other thing is done. This seventh bit gets flipped. It's known as the UL bit, the universal local bit. Oh, there's a history to this bit. Okay, it gets flipped. So that actually ends up changing this second hex hexadecimal digit. But here's our 64 bits now, with FFFE in the middle, and this second digit got changed because the bit got flipped, seventh bit got flipped. Okay. So let me show you on a Cisco router what this looks like. The link local address. Okay, so this is the MAC address of this gig zero zero interface. There's its 48 bit MAC address. On this router, I'm going to use the command show IPv6 interface brief. It's going to show me its link local addresses on the interfaces. That's what these are. Those are FE80. 
Now notice this on the gig zero zero. It used EUI 64. How do, can I tell it used EUI 64 and didn't come up with some randomly generated number here? So this is both correct. The MAC address, notice the MAC address, very similar to the MAC address except for this, this digit here, and FFFE. Most likely. So if you see FFFE there, you can pretty much be sure to use EUI64 to come up with the interface ID. Question. Yeah. I see the SC99 and the FE99. What would it be in the FC? The FC and the E. Here? Yeah. Uh, if you flip, if you, if you flip the seventh bit, it doesn't increment it by one. It will change, in this case, the C to an E. Now you notice that all three interfaces have a link local address. But wait a minute. If you look carefully, first of all, serial interfaces? Serial interfaces, how do they get a MAC address? Because what? Serial interfaces, what? Don't have MAC addresses, right? So, ah, no problem. I'll just grab the MAC address from my uh, gig zero zero interface and I'll use that. Do you see a problem here? What about these two link local addresses? They're the what? They're identical. Is that a problem? No, it shouldn't be. No. Link local addresses only have to be unique on the link. They don't go off the link. So if I'm a router, I have an interface to this network and an interface to this network. I can have the same link local address here that I have here, as long as they are on separate links. Because this link local address can only, will only talk to you with link local, link local to link local. Link local to link local here, but never link local address to link local address. So where do we use these link local addresses? Thank you. Read my mind. Okay. So first of all, we've seen these addresses when we do IP config, right? I've got an IPv6 address, it's just its link local address. So yeah, how did this one get assigned? Randomly. So that one, yeah, so that one there got assigned because you don't see the FFFE. I'm going to talk about that, why that's the case in a moment. Why gets why operating systems have moved away from the EUI 64 and went to win? Yeah, there's a reason. Okay, so um, I'm just cover a couple slides here, and we'll take a break. And I, I'm happy to show you the lab and. Stay around after, but I'd like to finish these slides and we come back if that's okay yeah. with all of you. Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. So first of all, we're going to see this after the break. Link local addresses are used by a device when it wakes up and says, "Hey, is there any IPv6 router out there?" Sends out this router solicitation message. Uh, so I wake up. Oh, I'll give myself an IPv6 link local address. I can talk to anybody on my link. Hey, is anybody out there an IPv6 router? And the IPv6 router will respond saying, yeah, I can talk to you link local to link local. And here's some address information. We don't even need a DHCP server. Let me show you that after the break. So in most networks, you don't even need to have a DHCP server involved. And that's to get a global unicast address. So we'll, this, we're just talking link local to link local for now. And then show you how it uses this router advertisement to create its global unicast address and get all kinds of other information. It's really cool. Also, routing protocols. So if you're familiar with, uh, you know, start with RIP. 
NG, EIGRP for IPv6, OSPF v3 for IPv6, VGP. The way routers communicate is over is using the local address. If you look at an IPv6 routing table on a router, the next hop router is its link local address. Because the next hop router is going to be on your link. The next hop router is not going to be two routers away. So link local. So let's make sure that we're just talking link to link. Now, the interesting thing, you can ping link local addresses. This computer can ping this computer's link local address on the same link. No problem. But if you're using a, so here I've got a router. And I'm going to ping the link local address of this router. Here's the interesting thing on, on what Cisco IOS has to do. We say ping FE80 double colon 2. And we know we want to ping that router. It's OK. The router goes, wait a minute. FE80 double colon 2 could be out this interface. Or it could be out that in the phone. Which way do you want me to send it? It doesn't have to be unique on that link. It couldn't be on those links. So iOS comes back and says, what is the output interface? And then we tell it, oh, serial 000, zero, zero that way. And iOS, guess what it says? No problem? No. It says, Rick, I want you to Specify the full interface name without spaces. <laughs> so you have to say serial 000 in Cisco IOS. Why is that? I have no idea. <laughs> I, you know, um, <coughs> this isn't the first command they've done this to. And eventually, I'm sure that will be done <coughs> at some point. Okay. And once that happens, oh, now I know where to send the ping. And I can ping that other route. Okay, when we come back from the break, I'll keep you take like five minutes. I mean, I could keep going, but I, you probably need five minutes. Uh, when we come back, I'm going to talk about uh, Slack and then also DHCP. How a device, like your device is at home and in school, will get its own global unit back at home. So let's go ahead and take five minutes and then we'll. I'll get started. If the, oh, one other thing I want to mention: the uh, at the end of this, there's a reception, right, and a raffle. Uh, maybe this isn't this isn't going to sweeten the deal at all to go to this. Uh, they're raffling off a my live lessons uh, video thing. So I'm not sure that helps. So probably makes oh, now I'll definitely go home early. Okay. All right. So we'll get started in five minutes. Do you like 40 copies of that? No, I don't care. Do you know anybody selling IPA some buyers out there for IPA before? I did talk to work, of course I went to it tomorrow. We have another, you know, we have another thing. We need to see the block from C. We really just need a class. CSU dance or whatever we want. We want an address. You have another side. When did Phoenix start like and we don't do that? That would make some colders? Maybe. So they didn't mention that. We got our own. So you know what you said is right, I mean, no good notion I got all these initiatives that people have to see a difference or something or not. It's hard to do with a lot of work just to be that on the weekend. Yeah. And that's why you had to, so, you know, I'm going to say, you know, 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 you know,
automatically gets its global unicast address. Now, it's link local, we talked about it, it can just give it itself a link local address. Let's talk about global unicast. Now, a lot of the centers around this protocol called ICMP v6, neighbor discovery. There's some new messages, and we're going to talk about these in a moment, router solicitation and router advertisement messages. They're part of ICMP v6. But real quick, since I'm here, let me talk about neighbor solicitation message, which doesn't have to do with Slack, but let me, since I've got it here. This is address resolution. Let me just do a quick tangent. This is ARC in IPv6. So in IPv4, I know your IPv4 address. I don't know your MAC. Uh, let me check my ARP cache. It's not there. I send out an ARP request. Hey, that's me. Let me send back an ARP reply. Great, I'll put it in my ARP cache. Now, ARP is sent directly over Ethernet. IP is not involved. Okay. And it's sent as a broadcast. Now, in my slides, in my live lessons, I talk about the disadvantage of that compared to what I'm going to show you with IPv6. In IPv6, I know your IPv6 address. I need to know your MAC address. I check my neighbor cache, like the ARP cache for IPv6. I go into detail in that in my, my lessons as well. I send out what's known as a neighbor solicitation message, very similar to an ARP request. This device says, hey, that's me. Let me send you my IPv6 address with my MAC address. I send back a neighbor advertisement, which is very similar to an R3 fly. Here's the, that goes in the neighbor cache. Here's the big difference. These neighbor, these are ICMP messages. Same information like an ARP request or an ARP reply. They're sent over IPv6 and in an e then over Ethernet. I won't go into this here, but this is a big advantage in IPv6. It uses a multicast instead of a broadcast. What that means is that the, the advantage of this to the host, the majority of cases, the NIC card on the host can filter this neighbor solicitation message 
to see if it's looking for me. That filtering can actually be done at the Ethernet NIC card. In IPv4, it's a broadcast. The NIC card says, oh, here you go, ARP. Take a look. You've got to process it. Here, the NIC card can go, I can pretty much determine whether or not this is for me or not without having to bother ICMP v6. That's the short version. Okay. Let's get into why we're here. Slack. Okay, so dynamic addressing happens with so uh, we'll take a look at Slack, and then later we'll look at Slack with DHCPv6, stateless, and then there's stateful. And I'll talk about the difference between stateless and stateful in a moment. Okay, so in IPv4, it's fairly simple. The computer boots up, hey, is there a DHCPv4 server out there? Server goes, yep, that's me, here you go. The host goes, great, I got my, my stuff. Well, that was easy. This option exists in IPv6. Stateful DHCPv6. We'll get that to that in a moment. So here's dynamic address allocation in IPv6. Okay, it uses router solicitation and router advertisement messages. Router solicitation and router advertisement messages and I'm the router, and you're the, de you're the devices. It's about router to device messaging. Router to device messaging to you and the router. Okay, so what happens is the computer boots up, gives itself a link local address, and then says, hey, is there any uh, IPv6 routers out there? Sends out a router solicitation message. The router says, that's me. Let me send you back a router advertisement. And in this router advertisement is one of three options which we're going to look at, all three. Slack, stateless address auto configuration. Slack with stateless DHCPv6. And Slack with stateful DHCPv6. Okay? So in this first case, VHCP, stateless or stateful, not even needed. Okay, so I said there's three options in the router advertising. Option one is the router saying, I am everything you need for your address and needs. No need to go talk to a state, to a VHCP V6 server. <laughs> Option two is the router says, I am everything you need for you to create your own address. <laughs> your global unicast address. But, you know what, I want you to go to talk to a stateless DHCP v6 server and get other information that, like a DNS address or a domain name. Because I, I didn't provide that in my router advertisement. The third option is the router says, hey, host, look, use me as your default gateway. But for all your address needs, go talk to a stateful DHCP v6 server, just like you did for IPv4. So the first two options, by the way, is the first option is Slack. We're going to look at that. The second option is a stateless DHCP v6 option. Both those cases, nobody is maintaining state of who has what address. When we say stateless, we mean there's no but no entity out there going, let's see, you've got this IPv6 address, you've got this IPv6 address, you've got this IPv6 address. It's just saying, hey, you created your own. How do we know those are unique? I'll get there. This last option is a stateful. And that's where there's a server going. Hmm. All right, just like IPv4, I'll do for IPv6. I'm maintaining who has what address. Okay, so obtain an IPv6 address automatically. Just go into the properties, obtain IPv6 address automatically. What I find interesting on my Mac, for IPv4, it says using DHCP. Then I want to get one automatically. But what it says for IPv6, it just says automatically. 
because it may not need a DHC. Chances are that's not what it's going to use. Well, sorry, sorry, in V6, does it always have a fixed address, or can you use a uh, you could either way. You can use you can do a static address if you want. You can just like you do. And you would want to on your servers, yeah. on your printers, on your routers. So let's take a look at what you're getting. So here's the router advertisement. It goes to a special multicast address. All IPv6 devices listen to this. It's from it's link local address. Now, I statically configured this. So this is how it would be, get this address on this interface. Okay. It's nice to have statically configured link local addresses on your routers because you can be using them. Okay. You can see, so this comes, so this is the IPv6 header. In the router advertisement test, it says, hey, this is our network. This is our proof. And guess what? Here's our prefix link. That goes out to all device, all IPv6 devices. Okay. Now, this router advertisement could also contain, here's the domain name, and here's a list of DNS servers. Okay. Well, let's say it's not in this case, but it could. The host gets it and says, okay, let's see what I can do with this. Ooh, prefix. I know what network I'm on. Ooh, prefix length. Okay, listening to Rick, that means one, two, three, four. There's my network portion. So I have 64 bits left for the interface ID, right? Okay. It's going to figure out the default gateway. Guess what the default gateway address is going to be? Hey, came from your link local address router? You're my default gateway. All right, now all I got to do is come up with a global unicast address. I know the prefix, one, two, three, four. I need four hex sets for the interface ID. How do I get that? One of two methods. EUI 64 or a random 64-bit value. No DHCP v6 server needed. So let's take a look. 64-bit interface ID. Slack can either say EUI 64. Ooh, I'm going to use your MAC address, so I'm, you're going to be known. I'll talk about that here in a moment. The other one is let the device come up with its own 64-bit value. Any reason why users like operating, smart operating systems that do not use EUI 64, do not use the MAC. What happens when your MAC address is associated, when your MAC address, and I'm on my MAC, but my MAC address is associated with my IPv6 address? Exactly. Those packets can be traced to my physical device. I don't want you knowing where I'm going and what I'm looking at and what I'm doing. Okay, I want to blame it on my colleagues or somebody, <laughs> my kids. Okay, so operating systems have actually been moving away from the UI 64 and going to the random 64 bit. My Mac OS still uses my version of OS 10. Linux is moving to privacy. Yeah, yeah. Not the same. <laughs> oh God, hold on to that question. <coughs> Even if the EUI 64 is kind of a possibility, right? Okay. Okay. So, so hold on to that question. That's a great question. Wait, random? Isn't there a chance that it might conflict with somebody else? Hold on to that thought. Okay. So let's take a look at the EUI 64 real quick. Again, it uses the MAC address, just like it did for the link local address. Same thing. Just take the MAC address. Split it in half, insert FFFE, flip that seventh bit. There's our 64 bits. There we go. Do IP config? I see the FFFE in the middle right here. So there's my interface ID. Now, a couple of questions. One question might be, 
why six, why didn't they just go with a 48-bit MAC address? I'm sorry. Why did, since MAC addresses are 48 bits, why didn't they just go with a 48-bit interface type here? Well, there's two reasons. First of all, things that are processed on 64-bit binders are processed more efficiently by the CPU. But more importantly than that, this is to accommodate 64-bit MAC address spec. So there's an IEEE spec for 64-bit MAC addresses. Okay. So randomly member chip, so this is a lot of the uh, operating systems, Windows 7 and later, are generating these randomly. So here on my Windows 7 device, we see no FFFE here. Now there's a great question that said, well, how do I know it's unique? Okay, so there's an RFC, because there's an RFC for everything. That used to state that devices had to do this, but it's no longer required. What I'm about to tell you now is only recommended. It's called duplicate address detection. So how can I make sure nobody out there is named Rick Graziani? Hey, Rick Graziani, would you come up here and give me five dollars? I mean, bro. Rick Graziani, if you're out there, raise your hand. Nobody <coughs> responds. I'm unique. It's like a gratuitous art in IPv4. What a device, the RFC says this. For any IPv6 address, link local or global unicast, whether it's created statically or dynamically, and that don't care how, it should do this. Before it uses that address, it should send it out saying, hey, whoever out there has this IPv6 address, send me your MAC address. Like, a, like an ARP request, right? Like a neighbor solicitation. And what is it hoping? Sets a timer, and what is it hoping? That nobody <laughs> responds. And if nobody responds, it says, hey, I'm unique. Any idea why you think IDTF changed it from required to recommended? How many possibilities do we have with 64 bit interface ID? 18 quintillion. They said, look, what are the people, uh, vendors, what are the chances that somebody's, you know, like they start playing the lottery if you, if you, if you start getting if that kind of an issue. <laughs> so, uh, but, however, you know, uh, iOS still does it, Mac OS still does it, Windows still does it. Still does this duplicate address detection. Okay. Now that is Slack. Now I'm just going to add something on to this. What if the router advertisement did not tell you <coughs> the domain name and the list of DNS servers? Okay. So there's another option. And by the way, the first option, which is Slack and Slack only, that's the default on Cisco IOS. There's slides that you can see. They're very easy. And I can point you to my presentations that have all the configurations and explanations for this. So we're going to take a look at Slack and setting a flag to say, hey, oh, you need to go talk to a stateless DHCP v6 server to get that DNS address and domain name. So, okay. so that flag is known as the O flag, the other configuration flag. You need to talk to a DHCP Server for other information. So it still creates its own address using Slack, just like what we covered. That doesn't change. It still uses the link local address for the default gateway from the router advertisement. That doesn't change. There's only one thing added. It talks to a DHCP v6 server. And the only that's her, just to get DNS and domain names. So here's the difference. Everything's the same except this. The other configuration flag is set to one in the router advertising. The host does still does the same thing, creates its so let's say it uses the privacy extension. So none of this changed. Here's the only difference. When it's done, 
creating its address, it says, oh, other configuration flag. There's other information out there from a stateless DHCP v6 server. Okay, that means I need to talk to a stateless DHCP v6 server, and the server will give me my DNS address and my domain name. That state still stateless. No man, nobody's maintaining the state. Okay, the third option, stateful. So same thing, router, router solicitation message, router advertising. Let me mention something about this router advertising message. It is not a router dictating to the device and saying, this is how you must get your address. Do you, do you think the host could ignore this router advertisement and just do what it pleases? Go talk to a DHCP v6 server? No matter what this router advertisement is? Sure. Yeah. It's, it's a suggestion to the device. Okay. The difference here is we have what we call the M flag set to one. Managed configuration flag. So what it will do is let me go over here. So here's the router advertisement message. This is still important. The router, this is key. The router advertisement message is still important to this host because the source address of the router advertisement message, the host is going to use that as its default gateway. Right now, the, the RFC states that the DHCP server will not provide default gateway. There is no better way for a host to know that its default gateway is valid and up than from a router advertising. And could we have multiple routers on our link getting multiple router advertisements which mean multiple default gateways? Yes. Okay. So all of this, but here's the difference. Manage configuration plan. So the host says, I'm just, look, manage configuration flag. I'm going to use you as my default gateway. But this tells me that I'm going to go talk to a stateful DHCP v6 server. So I'll go talk to, just like I, I would do in IPv4, I'll get my addressing information from a stateful DHCP v6 server and everything else. The only thing it got from the router advertisement was this default gateway. Now, in my presentation on, uh, I think it's on Slack or DHCPv6 on my website, for you Windows people, and if you have students that do this or implement this at home, let me and let's take a look at that presentation. There's another flag that you need to set with Windows. Let me, let me take two minutes here to explain something. Windows hosts are going to do this. Windows hosts are going to see this router advertisement message. And they're going to see the prefix, prefix link, and the managed configuration flag. And guess what Windows does? It says, oh, a prefix. Great. Let me create, using a pre this prefix, my own global unicast address. And I'll just create, because I'm Windows 7, I'll use a random 64-bit value. Now I have my IPv6 global unicast address via Slack. Oh, but your managed config flag is set to 1. Okay, well guess what I'll do? I'll also go talk to a stateful DHCPv6 server and get another address, another global unicast address. So Windows, because they like to be different, will have two addresses, one from Slack and one from the stateful server. There is a, and I can, I'll be happy to show you afterwards, there's a flag on, in the router advertisement that you can change through the, the autonomous address flag. You just clear it, and that tells the Windows host, do not use this. Do not use this. Max, you don't have to worry. Linux, you don't have to worry. But Windows has to be explicitly told, don't use me. Now you know a little something extra. But these are all in my PowerPoints. Okay, last but not least, can I just spend a couple of minutes on DHCP v6 PD for the home? Mm -hmm. And then I'll show you the lab, which you can do here or at home. 
it's just a, it's really not a lab, it's just an exploratory, exploration lab for on packet tracer. Let me explain how to get IPv6 at the home. First of all, to have Comcast, all you need is two things. IPv6 enabled routers and an IPv6 enabled modem. You've already turned it on to your home. That's it. Okay, so let me explain how it's getting its address. There was a lab sent out by, I don't know who in the academy, uh, on pre DHCP prefix delegation. If you see it out there, don't use it. It's totally wrong. It's wrong in what it's telling you it does, and it's wrong on how it enables it. So stay away from it. Okay? In my PowerPoint, I have a lab that will do it for you. Okay, let me explain IPv4. IPv4, the world is easy. All the ISP has to do is give this interface an address, a uh, public address on this link, right? So my router gets gets a public address, either using whatever method, DHCP or whatever, for that interface. As far as the home network is concerned, our ISP could care less because we're going to use a private address. And we're just going to use NAT to translate it to this address here. Okay? Well, IPv6, it's different. It's all about end-to-end -end reachability. We are going to get, yes, a global internet routable prefix. But it can't be this one. Routers connect different networks, right? So. Our interface will get an IPv6 address so it can talk to the ISP. But here's the difference. That's just like IPv4. And how it does that, by the way, any of those methods we just covered, Slack, stateful, stateless, most likely Slack, says here's your address. But what about this side? It needs its own IPv6 prefix. Okay. And this is what happens. Your home router will be running something called VHCP V6 prefix validation. It initiates the request to the ISP. It says, hey, I need a prefix to hand out to my LAN. And the, the, the ISP says, okay, here's a separate IPv6 prefix for you to hand out to your LAN. Has nothing to do with us. This is just for you to give back. And so what Comcast gives me is a slash 64. Okay? So they give me a slash 64. And then what my router does is sends out a router advertisement, that slash 64. And the hosts come up with their own interface IDs using privacy extension or UI 64 slash. Does that make sense? Uh, just so you know where this is coming. <coughs> so the RFC, there's a recent RFC about IPv6 for the home. When we talk about the future of IPv6, we are looking well beyond what we're doing for IPv4. They are looking at home networks in the future are going to be very different from the home networks today. You're looking at, you're going to need different networks for, a, for, certain, for your home network, for a guest network, for certain appliances. You can actually have different subnets. Uh, and this is, uh, you may, in the future, they're looking well beyond the way, the way that homes are connected today. They're looking at that homes will eventually be multi home and then connected with multiple connections to one or more ISPs. So they're looking well beyond kind of how we're doing business today. Um, anyway, one of the things that this RFC states is that every home should, and Aaron, by the way, our, our, our regional internet registry for North America, they, their policy is that ISPs should be giving homes slash 48s. So at home, you get a, should be getting, we know the Comcast right now, but the, the policy is, and the RFC states that homes should be getting subnets. <coughs> slash 48, 
uh, is recommended. It means you get 65,536 subnets. Each subnet was 18 quintillion devices. Now you think, oh, we're wasting bits. We're not cutting down binary trees to do this. Okay, it's okay. The whole idea of using slash 64s, even for point-to-point -point links between routers, use a separate slash 64 for each point-to-point -point link. It's all about being able to easily manage our IP addressing schemes. Not, it's not about conserving addresses. It's about manageability and making it easy for us to manage. Now I said at home, I, Comcast gives me slash 64. I called them up. This was, I should have recorded it. Uh, and said, you know, thank you. It's working. IPv6 is working. And, but I'm only getting a slash 64. I'm only getting one subnet with 18 quintillion devices. You know, I should be getting, you know, a, some subnets. You know, and so I, it, it just lost. They tried to send it to somebody, and it was, I was more worried about them turning off my, my cable, my internet, phone, <laughs> doing something wrong, or setting something. No, 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 it's okay. It's okay. Let me just point you to some things here on my website. I do have on my website, and you're welcome to, to hang out. I know the reception's coming up. Um, I'll show you, I have a Word document that if you want to have some practice with the addresses. And I provide the answers, too. So I'll show you this in a moment. I also have a packet tracer, and there's really nothing to configure, so let me show you a gotcha on it. But let me show you where all this stuff is on my website. So uh, let me go to my main page here. So this is my, my main page, the address that's on the board. If you want access to any of my CCNA or CCNP stuff, it's right there. CCNP route will be updated this semester, uh, next few weeks, for the new route course. Uh, so you're welcome to all that stuff. But here's my my uh, CCN my IPv6 resource page. Uh, presentations. So this is where I have all those PowerPoints. Uh, and there's no username or password for these. Just help yourself. Uh, the presentation for today, which is just some excerpts from the ones above, are right here. MPICT 2015. Help, I need to learn IPv6. There's a uh, packet tracer addressing and exercise. Let me kind of open that. Let me just show you what it is. So what I did here. This is a simple Word document. It just has the non-compressed formats. And I ask you to you know, omit the zeros, leading and trailing zeros. Where can I? I was going to try and uh, there we go. Zoom in. There we go. So just you know, and I provide the answers. Let me show you the answers. So there's the answers. There's a second page. And I give you an example here. From our ISP, we got a slash 48. Get away. OK. Uh, here's a sample host address, a slash 64. This is the, so the prefix from the ISP is 48. One, two, three. That's how the internet sees us. That's what I mean by the global routing prefix. Our network address, one, two, three, four. There's our subnet ID. How did I get focused to slash 64? So the first three hex hats is our global unicast, or I'm sorry, our global routing prefix, one, two, three. One, two, three, four. The slash 64, we just used this. This is now our subnet ID. So what's our first host? All zeros. Don't use that address for a host device. Two reasons. In IPv6, you can use colon colon for the interface ID. You know in IPv4 we can't use the all zeros or the all ones address, right? Yes. You can in IPv6. Don't. Don't use the all zeros. Two reasons. Two reasons. The all zeros can also be an any cast address. Don't worry about that. The real reason is it gets confusing. 
Am I looking at a host or am I looking at a network address? Okay. So here's the first host and last host. So anyway, what I've done is I've given you some uh, different ones and I do provide the answers. Right. Right here, just to show you how you can start looking at these things. Uh, on here, I also have a packet tracer exercise. So you can download the packet tracer, use uh, 611. Uh, and let me just show you, and I have some things here. What are the three prefixes? I don't have the answers, but if you have any questions, email me. I'll give you the answers. But it's basically, let me just show you, this is the packet tracer exercise. It's already configured and running. There's a gotcha in, I don't, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to, I need to talk to my good buddy Dennis Frezzo, who's the father of packet tracer. And I love packet tracer. But there's some issues with IPv6. Uh, one of the issues is they don't do anything with DHCP with it. But here I have like a, a static device, no problem. I configured my settings. Here's my, I, my gateway. I used the link local address as my default gateway. And I can, here's the DNS server, which is over here. My interface, I just configured the a static address. Here's the prefix link. It came up with its own link local address. F, 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 E in the middle. How do you think it came up with it? The UI 64, the MAC address. MAC address, throw that in the middle. There's one gotcha, and that's with these dynamic ones. These dynamic ones, you need to make sure that it sees here for dynamic, the default gateway, it got that from the router advertisement. And has it got the DNS server from the router advertisement. This is the gotcha. It comes up as a default DHCP no matter how you save it. It has to be on auto config. And I don't think these are very well done. So I gotta talk to them about changing this stuff. Um, but it will come up with just DHCP and you won't see any address here. So you have to click on auto config to make sure you see the address here. When you've done that, go back to global settings and make sure that you didn't lose this information here. There tends to be a problem when you click on one, it changes the one on the other, and you lose. So it's kind of a, so anyway, I got to get them to change that. So what you can do, is just take a look at this packet tracer exercise. Uh, I have a DNS server here. The only issue with the DNS server is that, uh, let me do services, DNS. Uh, like in IPv4, I created a record that has a name and an IPv6 address. Anybody see the problem here? It should be four A's. Yeah, it should be a quad A record. You don't have that, but it'll let me use an A record. So an A is for IPv4. Quad A, 4A is for IPv6. Why quad A? There's actually a reason. A is 32 bits. 128 bits is A, 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 A. Quad A. Makes sense to me. All right. So uh, anyway, you can play around with this. You can ping devices. Uh, you can ping global unicast addresses. You can ping using, I have a domain name, PC100, PC300. You can ping those because the state, they can resolve it with DNS. You can ping link local addresses, but you can only ping link local addresses on the same link. Okay, so this device and this device can only ping each other's link local address. This device cannot ping this device's link local address. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, sorry there wasn't much of a lab time, but I, I think this was more, yeah. And what's the address for the local host in IPv6? 
Uh, oh, for, uh, just uh, double colon for uh, yeah. double colon one. Okay. Uh, one last note, uh, just to me, since it's out there, we talked a little bit about there's those private addresses. The known as unique uh, ULA addresses, ULAs. Uh, those are addresses. Those will be used, like in homes and networks, when you have a device that you don't want to be able to anybody on the internet to connect to. You have a pro you have a printer at home. You have a server. At, you have something at home or some on your network. You want your network to be able to reach it, but you don't want the internet to be able to reach it. That's where you can use those addresses. Uh, those are known as uh, unique local addresses. Oh, okay. The private IP okay. six addresses. They are not meant to be translated to a public address. Okay. All right. Thanks for being hanging in there for for two hours with me. So, thank you.